storage hierarchy, which goes from memory on the CPU itself, on the main RAM of a computer, through to offline storage, such as tape and optical media backups. Early computer memory used something called magnetic core memory. This card would be about 10 centimeters aside. And if we look closely at what's in the center there, you would find lots of little magnets, little magnetic cores with wires in between them. The magnets could store a charge and you could set a particular magnet's charge to store a value or to clear the charge stored in the magnet. And that gives you a basic storage capability. Magnetic cores were incredibly stable. Indeed, magnetic core memory was still used in the early space shuttle because it was a very reliable technology, a very well understood technology and very resistant to damage and could maintain the contents of the memory even when power was switched off. So it actually retained its memory for a very long period of time. But it's not really used in modern computing systems at all. Instead what we find is DRAM or dynamic RAM. Here we can see some different DRAM chips and modules from a number of different years and eras. The more recent memory modules on the right, which as you can see contain a number of different DRAM chips in one circuit board that just slots into the computer. So modern DRAM modules may contain quite large capacities, uh, up to several gigabytes in one memory module, whereas earlier memory module chips might have only contained a few K of RAM on an individual chip. Prol DRAM follows a very similar operating principle, which is highlighted in this rather complex diagram here. And that if we look at the boxed area, we can see there is a transistor and a capacitor. So here's the transistor here. It's a capacitor here. And a capacitor is an electrical device that is able to store a charge for a period of time. So the individual memory cell is very simple. It's got two components, a transistor and a capacitor. And we have a row of these components connected together along a word or address line. That will connect all the cells in each row. And there are also, there's only one shown here in green, but there are two data lines connecting all the cells in each column. So by setting the circuits, so by setting a value to activate a particular address line and setting a value to activate a particular column, then you can address an individual memory cell, an individual bit of memory. So each of these cells in red is going to store a single zero or one value. And if we know which address line it's in, if we know which column it's in, then we can address and refer to that one cell. So for reading and writing, the signal is sent to make one address line active at a time. And then when we're reading, normally we would, we would read a whole word at a time. So what would normally happen is you make one address line active and you copy all of the bits down at the same time. And so this cell here, its value is copied down and it's copied down to this sense amplifier here it's called, but it's basically a buffer that just stores the values that have been copied from the RAM. When we're doing a write operation, it's basically the same idea. You put values into the buffer, we activate the lines, and with a particular active address line, that switches on the transistor so that they can receive the charge that we're sending up the line. So when the read state we activate the address line, signals are sent down and the zeros or ones are copied from each memory cell into the sense amplifier. In the write operation the values are stored in the sense amplifier and then sent up the address lines to the memory cells. There are some problems with DRAM however. Capacitors lose charge over time and the very small capacitors that are created in silicon chips lose their charge quite rapidly. So the memory cells need to be refreshed. So we need to put more electricity in just to keep the memory, the capacitor contents the same as they are. 
and the current standards for DRAM typically require memory cells to be refreshed every 64 milliseconds. It's also possible that magnetic and radiation interference can cause a bit to flip randomly. So more expensive DRAM is available that uses some sort of parity checking or error correcting code. These DRAM modules generally cost a little bit more because it adds extra circuitry so the memory in the system costs will be higher. And for a lot of systems you will be find that you are able to buy memory modules with or without error correcting code. And the error correcting code chips and modules will normally cost a bit more than the modules without. For most home computer use it's okay to do without the error correcting code. The random bit flip is not very common but in servers and other situations in business systems it can be quite important. SRAM is static RAM. Now, unlike DRAM, static RAM doesn't need to be refreshed. It keeps the value that's been stored in it. When power switched off altogether, the cells will lose the value that's stored. But as long as the power is on, you don't need to refresh the cell, it's going to keep the value. And it's built out of typically six or more transistors. And you can see one of the circuits here. So it's clearly a lot more complicated. There's more circuitry involved. More circuitry means that the chips are more expensive. They can be faster and they use less power than DRAM because you don't need to refresh them. And they can be easier to integrate into some systems because there's no need for special circuitry to refresh the memory. For long term storage, RAM is relatively expensive and power hungry. It's good for storing active programs in a running computer. It's very wasteful for storing inactive programs and data and it's completely useless for storing anything that needs to be kept when the power is off. And so we have a range of different storage media which we're going to look at. We also have cache memory and we cover this elsewhere in the course but the general principle for cache is that a small amount of high performance memory can act as a local copy of some data that's stored in a cheaper but slower memory form. So for example, most CPUs have a cache that store some of the program data from main memory. And that allows the CPU to operate on that memory at full speed and only needs to slow down when it needs to get another chunk of data from main memory. Or disk drives, especially hard disks, may use RAM chips to cache some of the data that's been recently used or accessed to try and limit the dependency on using the disk itself to read and write data to allow faster access. Quite obsolete now, but we looked in class at some of the floppy disk formats. And here we can see 8 inch, 5 and a quarter inch and 3 and a half inch floppy disks. 3 and a half inch floppy disks were still in regular use until probably around about 5 or 10 years ago. They're quite rare to see nowadays. What these media all have in common is that inside them they have a flexible disk that's covered in magnetic particles. If you think of it, little tiny bits of iron filings for example. A typical capacities of a three and a half inch floppy disk are typically from 1.44 megabytes to two to just under three megabytes. 